here, if you don't mind. Do you oh, really I want need, to? I, I need the water. Can I grab that water? You prefer the ad? Yes, you might. <laughs> no? Hello, everybody. Welcome. Uh, we're going to have our first panel discussion uh, on the subject of black holes. Um, and uh, to present it, we have Derek Muller, uh, who's best known for his uh, YouTube channel, Veritasium. Uh, it's good for an astronomy subject because he has astronomical viewing figures, six and a half million subscribers, getting on for 700 million views, I believe. Uh, and he's also a correspondent on the uh, Netflix show, Bill Nye Saves the World, where I believe he saved the world. Well, we're going to find out. Uh, welcome, everyone. It is uh, my extreme pleasure to be hosting this first panel of the Breakthrough Prize Symposium 2020. Uh, the panel is entitled, Will Black Holes Give Up Their Secrets to Science? So we will look at some of the secrets they have already given up, and perhaps uh, which other secrets uh, are, are possible in the future that they may give up. So uh, joining me on the stage, are uh, uh, people who are kind of uh, inspirations of mine, uh, people whose work I have covered in videos on YouTube. So I'm so excited to uh, introduce, to my left, Shepard Doleman. He is an astrophysicist at the Center for Astrophysics, Harvard and Smithsonian, and a project co-leader of Harvard's Black Hole Initiative. He is director of the Event Horizon Telescope Collaboration, which won the Breakthrough Prize in Fundamental Physics for producing the first ever photograph I don't know if we'd really say photograph, but a, an image of a black hole. Uh, uh, next to him, we have Andrew Strominger. Uh, <laughs> Andrew Strominger is a theoretical physicist at Harvard University. He has contributed to numerous advances in string theory and quantum gravity, including groundbreaking work on black holes, and he won the 2017 Breakthrough Prize in Fundamental Physics. So he will be representing sort of the theoretical side of physics uh, for this panel discussion. And on the far end, we've got Samaya Nisenka, who is an astrophysicist and spokesperson for the Grappa Center for Excellence in Gravitation and Astroparticle Physics at the University of Amsterdam. She shared in the 2016 Special Breakthrough Prize in Fundamental Physics for her role in LIGO, that's the Gravitational Wave Detector, and this year's New Horizons Prize for developing new techniques to extract fundamental physics from astronomical data. I think that's kind of interesting, to, to extracting fundamental physics from astronomy. That, I, I, I just find that very cool. So again, we've got sort of experimentalists on the ends here and our, our, our theorist in the middle. I want to start very simple, very broad, and just ask this question about what are black holes? And Andy, maybe I'll throw that one to you. Fundamentally, what are these things? Well, if you have, uh, so for example, on the Earth, uh, if you have a rocket ship that wants to get off the Earth, you've got to get it going at 11 kilometers per second. And then if there's no friction, it will go on forever and will escape the Earth and it will uh, disappear into outer space. It needs that extreme speed, 11 kilometers per second, because otherwise gravity would pull it back. Otherwise gravity would pull it back. On the moon, it's easier. You only have to go seven kilometers per second. But if you have too much mass in one place, you have to go uh, f faster than 186,000 centimeters per second, and that's the speed of light, and nothing can go faster than the speed of light. And so according to Einstein's theory of relativity, it's really a very simple consequence of it, that if you have too much mass in one place, uh, nothing can get out, not even light, and that is exactly what uh, Shep, excuse me, didn't see. <laughs> there was a black hole where they saw nothing right. uh, in the middle of that beautiful image. Now, I just want to follow up with this question that light doesn't have mass, so people might tend to think that light wouldn't respond to gravity, right? Which is typically thought of as this attraction between masses, and yet light is affected by gravity. Light has energy. Uh, we use it to power things. Um, you can shoot a light beam up and it will hold the paper up. In fact, they're planning to make uh, spaceships in that way. Um, and so it has energy, and because of that. It has energy, that. and anything that has energy uh, is subject to gravitational attraction. Mm -hmm. Can I add one thing to what Andy said? 
So we were asked what a black hole is, and, and you gave kind of a definition of an event horizon. But I didn't hear singularity in there, right? So there's, when I think of a black hole, I think of matter <laughs> collapsing into a singularity, and then the, the event horizon forms around that singularity. So th and there's two different things going on here, right? You've got the singularity where all the laws of physics break down, where the things we heard about from supergravity, where right. GR and right. quantum mechanics have to finally shake hands together, right? And then you've got this event horizon, which it can be much farther away, which is very macroscopic. That's and that's, right. that, that's, that's kind of what I study. I study the very boundary of that. And right. that's where the light can't escape. But some of the secrets are deep inside. Right? Some are deep inside. Some are just inside. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I love how we, metaphysical we've gotten we can't, we just can't, so briefly into this panel. We can't, we can't even get a micron inside the horizon. Mm -hmm. So what you've seen, we believe that deep inside there, there is some kind of singularity where the matter, the force of gravity has become so strong that the matter just kind of went insane. But mm -hmm. already just right at the edge of where you could see, just beyond that edge are things that we've just really been unable to understand. Let me That's see. what's so wonderful about it. Let me see if I can paint a picture of a black hole, not like the image that you've captured, but kind of what you're discussing there. So yeah. Andy, I heard you talking about when you have too much mass in one place and mass goes crazy. I yeah, think I'm yeah. quoting you correctly, right? <laughs> so essentially, like if you concentrated a, a, a ton, you know, like 30 solar masses into a tiny point, right? That is your singularity. Yeah. That's kind of like your divide by zero point where, you know, everything goes nuts and we just don't know. And that's why we call it the singularity. Yeah. I just want to demystify that word a little bit for people who you know, hear, hear people throw it around. But it really means you know, uh, such an extreme place in our universe that we, the physics doesn't, you, know, you can't really describe it. Right. And then out some distance from that, you have essentially a sphere, which would be the event horizon, which is this point, you know, as we're saying, if you're inside there, we can't get any information because light can't come out from right. inside that sphere. Right. So it's not like a hard sphere or anything, but it's a, a sphere inside which, is this fair? Is that a fair picture? It's fair. Okay. Mm -hmm. let, me ask, let me ask another question about, like, what are the different sizes of these things? Uh, um, no, that, that's more for Samaya. Samaya, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so in terms of, like, the masses of? Um, the masses and the sizes. And how does the mass relate to the size? Excellent question. Um, I'll first, I think, sort of um, briefly map out, I guess, the kind of si the masses that we expect for astrophysical black holes, and those are the sort of the uh, black holes that I personally am interested. In, but I think Andy can talk about the more theoretical physical physical black holes, but um, you know, as a theoretical physicist. But um, in terms of <coughs> the the end states of stellar evolution, in terms of massive stars, we're expecting kind of black holes potentially down to a few solar masses, you know, being formed basically from the end of supernova, uh, massive stars basically collapsing, going supernova, and there being some, their um, mass being so great that they eventually form a black hole. And um, <coughs> up to sort of, 10, 50, 60 solar masses in terms of what one can anticipate to have from just you know, <coughs> th this um, basically collapse of the massive star. But as we've seen from the LIGO detections, you, know, you can get these mergers of black holes that are forming black holes that are heavier. And then there are astrophysical black holes that we expect um, from intermediate black holes. We have yet to actually detect these or observationally detect these, detect these as well as supermassive black holes, and these are the um, black holes that the Event Horizon Telescope actually observed, which are happening, you know, at the million to million solar masses to ten to the nine solar mass sort of range. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think that's sort of the zoo of astrophysical black holes that we either directly observe through the light, as well as from gravitational waves that we're seeing at the moment. Yeah. 
So I'll let um, Andrew talk about, I guess, the more the smaller well, black I, hole. I, one I, think, I, think, I think it's, it's worth emphasizing, right, that black holes vary <coughs> dramatically In from size. you know the mass of the sun to billions of times the mass of the sun. Mm -hmm. And so when we talk about a black hole, we could mean, you know, kind of very different and very different sized things. I don't know if you want to. Well, so so let, let me say a couple of things. I, I think Samaya said it very well. You have this huge range. And I was talking to somebody earlier, I think maybe David Julius, and I was ex explaining that the LIGO detections and the Event Horizon Telescope detections are kind of like saying that a mouse is the same as an elephant. Right? You think about it for me, like, yeah, I guess they have feet, you know, and they have a smell thing, you know, and one is a big long trunk, and one is like a little quivering like nose, but they're the same kind of thing, right? And it's amazing to me that the black holes that Samaya is seeing with LIGO are the same from an Einstein's perspective as the one that is a billion times more massive that we're seeing with the Event Horizon Telescope. And if you took the Earth and you scrunched it into a black hole, it'd be about an inch across. Like a couple of centimeters yeah, across, the size of the right? Grape, I think, yeah. And then it, it scales with mass, so the <laughs> size of the black hole just scales you know, linearly, you know, with mass. And and so if you get to um, you know a billion solar masses, then you're looking at something that's bigger than our solar system. So that's the the zoo that Samaya is talking about ranges, you know, in that way. Right. But it, but it, it is a strange prediction of the Einstein equation that the only thing essentially the only thing that is different about uh, black holes of different sizes from a micron up to millions of miles, they're just bigger versions of the same thing. Mm -hmm. Round, maybe they have some spin, but they don't uh, differ otherwise. And that's very curious and difficult to reconcile. I, mean, I think that is holes. one of the most beautiful things about black holes is that they are kind of our simplest unit that we have in astronomy in the sense that you only really need two numbers to describe them, yes, their mass and their spin, at least in terms of the ones that we expect to be there astrophysically. And I mean, mm. that's just incredible when you think about, yeah, the entire cosmos, yes, that there are these objects that where you can just you know, entirely describe them by two numbers. Um, yeah. It's not like a star. Every star is different. Every star has different <coughs> chemical composition and the molecules are moving in different ways and has sunspots and all kinds of complicated epiphenomena. A black hole, you know its mass and its spin, that's it. So my understanding is that our galaxy is kind of littered, littered with these stellar mass black holes, the ones that are similar in mass to our sun. C can you give me a rough ballpark for how many are out there in, in, in our galaxy? How many stellar mass black holes are, are kicking around in the Milky Way? Is, mm. there, is there a ballpark? Mil mil millions. Um, millions? On the yeah, order of millions? But when you went to image one, you didn't look at one of these stellar mass black holes. Do you want to talk about that and, and why you picked the targets that you oh, did? Oh, yeah. So, so yep. Yeah. The, the zoo of black holes is pretty broad. Um, we attack them in different ways. And the reason we attack them is because they're the best cosmic laboratories we have. If you want to look at the, where the theories break down, you want to go to the most extreme laboratories. That's why we're all doing this, I think. Um, in, thought, in experiments of the mind, as with Andy, or with uh, different telescopes, as with us. Um, the reason we went to this, these large black holes for the Event Horizon Telescope is because they're the only ones big enough that we can see. We could never get the angular resolution with any telescope that we have to see an image, a stellar mass black hole. It has to be um, a supermassive black hole. And there are only two of them that we know of that we can do this with. There's Sagittarius A star, which is a four million solar mass black hole in the center of our galaxy. And that's about 50 micro arc seconds across. So the whole shadow is 50 micro arc seconds, which is the size of, of, a, of a, a grapefruit on the moon. And uh, we have another one, which is the M87, which, we, which is one we did image, which is a little bit smaller than that. The next biggest one is so small that we could never hope to do that yet. But if we launch a satellite into space and we orbit the Earth or go out to some uh, larger distance, then we could bring a lot more black holes into range. And perhaps let's briefly address the question of if you're trying <coughs> to image something that's totally black, how do you actually image it? Like, how do you get a picture? 
Ah, <laughs> yes, so, so it turns out that black holes are attractors, and they, all this gas and material is trying to get into them, and um, they're trying to get into such a small volume that they naturally heat up to billions of degrees. So in a paradox of their own gravity, black holes tend to shine very brightly because this gas, just before it goes through the event horizon, is very, very hot and glowing. So we are seeing with the Event Horizon Telescope the last glow of material before it disappears through the Event Horizon. And that allows us to make that nice measurement of the photon ring. And what have we found out by doing these different types of astronomy, both using electromagnetic waves and now using gravitational waves? What have we been able to really determine and uncover uh, about black holes? Samaya, so what, what are the big <coughs> sort of yeah, last so, five years. So I think from gravitational waves, the unique probe has been, you know, if you assume general relativity is correct, um, <clears throat> inferring essentially the masses of these stellar mass black holes. Actually, the first event was surprisingly much heavier than we had anticipated from just looking at X-ray stellar mass binaries, for instance, in our galaxy. Um, you know, they had, the two black holes had, um, masses of 29 and 35 solar masses. And this was actually a surprise um, in terms of, well, some people will say they also predicted this, but it was actually quite astounding when you compare it to you know, the previously known X-ray binary black holes that were inferred basically from the electromagnetic radiation around this. So I think you know, having a unique probe, a different way of actually measuring the properties such as ma you know, the actual masses and not having to depend on the actual astrophysical model, which includes you know, a lot of complicated nonlinear physics when you actually model basically the emission that you expect for X-ray binaries where you have a star which is you know, being basically um, orbiting a black hole and so that's how you're inferring the mass. You know, there are a lot of assumptions that you have to assume in terms of the accretion disk, ex exactly you know, how the matter is being accreted onto the system, whereas with gravitational waves we had this you know, unique probe onto the masses. One of the hopes is that as the instruments get more sensitive with higher signal to noise ratio, if we're also able to observe more cycles in band of these systems, we will maybe have information, for instance, about the spin. And then I think the next big question will be answering actually how do these systems actually form? How do stellar mass binary black holes, you know, where do we expect them? To, uh, you know, do we know that most massive stars are actually in pairs, but you know, it's unclear whether the ones that we've seen have been formed dynamically or else in isolation, for instance, in the galaxy. And so all these questions, I think, will be answered you know, as we move into the era, as we are doing, in terms of population statistics. And Shep, from getting that image, what could you determine about black holes? I mean, when you go to image a black hole, James Corden made the joke yesterday that your image looks kind of like a hole, a black, you know, it's kind of like what you'd expect. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was humorous, right? Everybody's a comedian. Right? You know, yeah. Well, yeah. James Corden in particular. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? But, but I think yeah, that... Who, who would have thought a comedian is funny? And... <laughs> but I think there's a serious, a serious question which underlies that joke, which is, what could you have seen if not what you saw? So, so, so I think that's a really good question. I want to get back to the title of this session, which is, will black holes give up their secrets? And the question is, what are the secrets? Like, what do we hope they'll give up? And, and uh, I, I'll tell you a little bit what I think some of the secrets are. And I think that, I think Andy holds the key to some of the other secrets here. But, um, you, you, so you ask yourself, can we test Einstein's theory, right? You know, do, in the one place where Einstein's gravity could break down, where we can see it, does it? So that's one secret that we're trying to, to get at. In the most extreme gravity regime, right? Does the, this the, theory still at hold the edge of a black well. hole? So Samaya with the with the LIGO mergers has seen that ring for stellar mass black holes. We saw it you know, visually, and we, to the extent that we can make these precision measurements, we've confirmed this photon ring, that this is the ring that photons are actually moving around in an orbit around the black hole. We've measured that with a yardstick, and we've reported it back to Einstein, and he's like given us an A 
on our paper, <laughs> which is kind or, of nice. Or is it you giving you know, Einstein an A? We on... don't. We no, 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 no. We, we don't do that. He, 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 <laughs> no, he's the, he's the greater. We are the pupils always, right? <laughs> and uh, let's not mess with the Einstein. Hey. Yeah. And um, but then more than that, then I, I look outward and I think, how do black holes, despite being the smallest objects predicted by Einstein, how do they? you know, um, power these jets that can pierce entire galaxies and change the night sky as we know it. And to understand that, we have to look at the magnetic field structure around the black holes, which is being torqued up and like, a, like an egg beater is flinging things out at light speed from the North and South Pole. Like, nobody knows how that works. And so in order to understand the secrets of why the night sky looks the way it does, we have to see how these engines the centers of galaxies do what they do. And that's what the Event Horizon Telescope is going to be focused on in the decade to come. You know, all the wisps I was showing before, like those are very important. Like how does the black hole make things orbit around it? How does it expel all this energy? But, but then in terms of secrets, what I'm very interested in is looking inward and understanding where all the information goes. That's all, it's an entirely different universe. That's why black holes are so exciting. They, they affect things on large scales, but they also plumb the, the, the limits of what we know about fundamental physics. And I wonder, Andy, Andy if, this, <laughs> if this gets to the idea that there's kind of paradoxically, we believe, black holes which suck everything in, and yet they also have a mechanism for evaporating, for giving out what was inside them. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah. I, I'd like to, though, put it, uh, add a little perspective that I hasn't been in the discussion so far. So the black holes were discovered 100 years ago. They were predicted 100 years ago. And people had been arguing continuously for the last 100 years about what a black hole is and what's inside it and how it, how it works. And for most of that 100 years, there seemed to be no consistent answer to various versions of that question, so much so that many people, including Einstein, who wrote in 1939 a paper that black holes don't exist, they're too weird. And so it really is a historical moment. I mean, I, humbling for me to be sitting beside the, the giants who saw for the first time in 100 years uh, in different mediums a black hole. 100 years, we've been wanting to see them, now we saw them, they're there. And of course, that made me feel good because uh, I've been working on them for 30 years and I'd hate to think that the thing I was working on <laughs> for 30 years <laughs> didn't exist. Um, and the puzzles that they present, um, the things that Einstein worried about, I think we understand, the work of Hawking and Penrose and so on explained that, but then there's the the quantum puzzle of black holes, of all the information that's in the black hole and how it gets out. That is a deep puzzle that we're not gonna solve this year, but we do have to you know, see the black holes before we can measure them. And of course, the measurements haven't told us how to solve Hawking's puzzle about quantum information, but you have to see it, a basic image of it, before you can see the more detailed. So I wonder if and we And we'll get there eventually. And it is an amazing thing that this is the moment in which I think black hole theorists and black hole observationalists are now talking together. Shep and I wrote a paper together a couple months ago. <laughs> and um, so we don't know where we're going, but but we're talking and we're thinking about the experiments and we're trying to understand it. We don't have an answer. Yeah, I th sorry to interrupt. Well, I was just curious if we can nail down this idea of informa information any clearer for this audience. Um, well, there's a, there's a, in his famous paper, um, uh, uh, Stephen Hawking wrote a paper which said that there is some insane number of gigabytes inside a black hole, enough so that the Google data banks would fit inside a black hole a trillionth of a trillionth of an inch. That's if you take into account quantum effects, you infer that black holes are the best 
hard drives in the universe. Now, this contrasts what, with what Einstein and Schwarzschild told us, in which we were discussing a moment ago, that black hole are featureless objects which don't even really have an interior, and they don't store any information. So there's a basic paradox where two different ways of looking at the same system lead to the opposite conclusion. And that is a fundamental paradox in modern physics, and many people are trying to uh, resolve it and have been for decades, and we will solve that problem. Uh, You're confident. It, is that a prediction? Yeah. yeah, that sounds like a prediction. We, we solve the pick because we solve every problem. In, there hasn't been a problem in science that we just could never solve. Sometimes it takes a long time. <laughs> Except my, the ones that haven't been time. solved yet. Except what? <laughs> well, we'll get, we'll get it. There's no reason we can't get it. You know? And, I'm not saying tomorrow, but we'll get it. And when we do, that'll be worth a breakthrough prize. Uh, maybe several. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but but the, the, the cool thing, when Andy said they were writing a paper together, uh, it, it's true. Uh, there have been some, there's been some great work by um, a student and postdoc in, in Andy's group and by uh, somebody in the Event Horizon Telescope, Michael Johnson and Alex Lupsaska. And, and, and they, together, they have been looking at what happens right at the boundary of the black hole. And it turns out that light can go around half an orbit, and that's mostly what we see with the Event Horizon Telescope. But then some of the light just continues on and makes another orbit, and then it makes another orbit. And it turns out that close to the black hole, you wind up with an infinite number of nested orbits, and they all have images imprinted on them of the universe. And uh, we're going to see it. See the now, look in his eyes? Yeah. Now, I, I just want to say, so, so, so things get so weird around a black hole. Like, imagine that. Around a black hole, you've got nested images of the entire universe going back for all of time, right? Now, they get fainter and fainter as you go around, right? So every time they get exponentially fainter. And you think to yourself, wow, I can never see that. Now, that's, that's where the gold is, right? Yeah, yeah. Not just in the neutron star, neutron star mergers. But, but if, you, um, if you build a, an interferometer, if you take a, a telescope far from the Earth, let's say at the Lagrange point, and you pair it with the Earth, then you get such high angular resolution, like 0.1 micro arc seconds. Now you're looking at, I don't know, like what's on the moon, a grain of salt on the moon, or even smaller than that. Then you might be able to start teasing out these nested rings of emission uh, that, were, that were the subject of this paper. And then you can really start to look at the spin of the black hole just instantly. You get the spin of the black hole. You know, instantly you understand all these tests of Einstein. So, when we talk about the secrets of the black hole, I, I'm, 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 I'm enthused because of the ingenuity yeah. of what we can do and the theory th that's coming uh, to explain some of this stuff. And that's, that's the intersection I think is going to be very fruitful. You know, Einstein taught us that space and time are not what we thought they were. It gets curved, it does weird things. And he explained little effects like bending of light by the sun and the precession of Mercury's perihelion is effects of the curvature, weird curvature of space. But when you get to a black hole, it's really curved. And the world around a black hole is really different. It's not like our world at all. And now we're seeing it. Well, I would love to continue this conversation for another hour. I think I could definitely get sucked into this particular black hole. Um, but our time is up, and so we will have to say a huge thank you to our panelists. Please join me in thanking them. And please uh, stick around, because we have uh, right now, coming up on this stage, a panel about the future of cancer therapy. So please stay seated, stick around for that. Moderating our panel, we're delighted to have with us Luke Timmerman. He's an award-winning journalist, author, and entrepreneur, uh, and also the founder of the biotech newsletter, Timmerman Report. And we've got an all-star panel of life scientists to talk about the future of cancer therapy. You already mic'd, I think, yeah. You know, there's... I'll sit here.
Okay. Okay, I think we're right now. Okay. Right. Thanks, thanks so much to the organizers of the Breakthrough Prize and to UCSF for putting on such a stimulating day of biology and physics and, and even math. Um, uh, we haven't talked about cancer today. Uh, here we're going to talk about the future of cancer therapy. And you know, this is a huge area of inquiry, obviously. It's about a third of all pharmaceutical industry investment, big portion of the NIH budget. Uh, and we're really lucky tonight to have uh, some real leaders in the field with complementary perspectives on where we're at and where we're going. So to my immediate right, uh, Bob Weinberg. Uh, he's a professor at MIT and the Whitehead Institute, really uh, one of the most influential cancer biologists of the past 50 years, uh, Breakthrough Prize winner from 2013. Uh, next to him, uh, Napoleon Ferrara, uh, another Breakthrough Prize winner from 2013 uh, for his work back at Genentech, late 80s and throughout the 1990s on uh, understanding the VEGF receptor and signaling pathway, uh, vascular endothelial growth factor, which is a, a technical way of saying uh, it's a form of uh, how tumors can uh, lay down blood vessels to grow and spread. And uh, he figured out the way <laughs> to, to make an antibody that would bind with that and, and curb that process. It's one of the most, most successful cancer drugs in the world today. Huge achievement. And on the far end, uh, Michelle Arkin. She's professor of pharmaceutical sciences here at UCSF. Uh, also has some biotech experience in her, her past, uh, working on all kinds of new small molecules and different types of molecules that can bind with a lot of the targets that so many biologists have been working to describe over the years, new targets for cancer drugs. So um, now, for those who are not that familiar with the cancer story, it's kind of a mixed bag. There's been some successes here and there, which get heralded a lot, and a lot of uh, uh, meh. <laughs> uh, you know, there's uh, certain kinds of cancer like multiple myeloma or HPV or chronic myeloid leukemia where you can look and say prognosis is getting much, much better. Uh, big, big strides. And then there are others like glioblastoma, pancreatic cancer, ovarian, where there has not been a lot to report on. Um, but we're, we, we do have a lot of more information at our fingertips now for going after some of these diseases. Maybe, maybe I should just start really simple. Um, for those of you who on this panel, you, you've seen a lot the last 10 years. Just very simply, what would you say would have been the biggest advance, the biggest achievement in cancer of the past 10 years? In the treatment of cancer? Yes. Well, immunotherapy against cancer would be the one that stands out. Mm -hmm. Now, for those unfamiliar, how would you define that, describe immunotherapy? Well, to unleash the, the latent powers of the immune system so that the two immune cells, which previously were held in check, would now be liberated to be able to aggressively attack cancer cells, which they previously could not do. There was a disguising mechanism that tumors use to yes. protect themselves from that immune surveillance. And we've learned through pharmaceutical science to interact with those checkpoints and release the brakes, so to speak, yep. so the immune system can attack the tumors. Yep. That's been a big one. But what it, it's been a big one because of the dramatic effects it's had on a very small number of malignancies. And like many of the therapies that we may talk about in our session today, it's been dramatically successful in a small number of malignancies. And it's not yet clear whether those successes will be generalizable to a larger number of solid tumors, for example, above and beyond, for example, melanoma and, and lung cancer. Um, and to the extent that they are more generalizable, how durable will be the response? Because uh, many of the therapies that have been developed over the last decade and a half, two decades, are often able to elicit dramatic regression of tumors only to have these regressed tumors being replaced by relapsing tumors which somehow acquire resistance to further therapy and now begin to grow aggressively and threaten the uh, life of the cancer patient. 
so that the victory is only a very transient one, a pyrrhic victory. But isn't that part of what's exciting about immunotherapy in that we are seeing some of these durable, long-lasting responses, not for everybody, but for 10, 15, sometimes 20% of patients, their, their tumors are, uh, are in check for years. Well, we don't know yet for how long. And by the way, conventional therapies are able to elicit durable responses, indeed cures. So some of the most primitive uh, therapies, radiation, surgery, uh, cytotoxic chemotherapy, when put together, are able to create cures. And those therapies haven't really changed that much over the last decades. In spite of the fact that they're not necessarily molecularly based, they've been ultimately very successful. The, 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 uh, the dramatic reductions, for example, in the mortality from breast cancer um, that have uh, been very real have resulted over the last uh, decade in a 30, 35% reduction in age-adjusted mortality from breast cancer. And most of that is due to very traditional treatments, not to immunotherapy. The, the one uh, molecular aspect of that is that Herceptin, the antibody against breast cancer cells, um, which uh, is made at uh, Genentech, um, is one new uh, arrow in the quiver. Yeah, for about a fourth or a third of breast cancer patients who have that mutation, you can make a targeted drug against that, and, and that has been very successful. Yeah. Um, but um, Napoleon, I'll ask you the same question. What would you say uh, has been the biggest advance of the past 10 years? I would certainly agree that immunotherapy has been a, a, a <coughs> very important advance. Maybe it's the most you know, visible right now. I think it's a, uh, perhaps there is a, some great expectation about immunotherapy. The, the reality is that, as, as Bob was saying, that works in very well in only in a subset of patients. There are major cancer type like a colon cancer. At least the majority of colon cancer do not respond. Glioblastoma do not respond. You know, breast cancer is very difficult to tell. You know. Uh, but certainly in, in some tumor, like in melanoma, there has been a very, has been a, people consider it to be a game changer. I even though if you look at the numbers, they're not even so dramatic. Let's say the initial study with the NTCTLA4 showed that, you know, the standard therapy, which was a, thought to be very ineffective, at five years, 10% of patients were alive. With the uh, immunotherapy, 20%. So still it's a significant improvement, but still the odds of dying were pretty significant. <laughs> but what I think has been probably most you know, promising is the possibility to make a number of combination of therapy. Uh, in, uh, uh, there is a very universal combination. One that I can, kind of find particularly interesting is the co recent combination, for example, with anti-angiogenic agent and immunotherapy. Uh, as yesterday, last week, actually, Russia announced that, you know, a, a tumor which has been historically intractable, like hepat hepatocellular carcinoma. Now, anti-angiogenesis with immunotherapy. So for those unfamiliar, it's uh, a, one drug that cuts off the blood flow to tumors yeah. and then another one that releases the brakes on the immune system. So you've, you, in theory, have a couple of complementary mechanisms, a couple different ways to attack that tumor. It's uh, absolutely right. It can be even more complicated than that because, uh, for example, VEGF has uh, some unsuspected, you know, an anticipated effect of the immune response. It's been shown now for years, first by, actually, by Steve Rosenberg. If you give uh, an anti-VEGF antibody, there is a very significant increase in tumor infiltrating you know, or lymphocytes in the tumor. The mechanism is not very clear, but the phenomenon has been uh, very reproducible. And this could be uh, uh, some kind of a, 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 a cellular substrate for, for this additivity, which uh, once again has been seen, you know, there is already an, an approval in, uh, in non-small cell lung you know, cancer. There's been very exciting data even in, uh, in, renal, in renal cell cancer in combination with the Keytruda with the TKI like excitinib. Very, very very substantial, could become a new standard therapy. So this is, a, but there is a, a, a broad spectrum of a combination which looks very exciting. We've got targeted therapies, we've got uh, anti-angiogenic, immunotherapy. Michelle, you're thinking about a lot of these different types of modalities, is the word we use, different small molecules, targeted antibodies, uh, peptides, different ways of approaching targets inside cells, on the surface of cells. Um, what um, what, what makes you um, 
excited about what you've seen the last, say, five to 10 years? Yeah, you know, I think it's, it's all the things that we're talking about. So cell therapies, I would add that. So designer cells, CAR-T therapies, for example. So where you take a patient's T cells, you arm them, and then you give them back to the patient, and the patient's own cells kill their cancer. So what's really exciting about all this is how much biology is finally coming to fruition. So in the last 20 years, we understand biology. So, I mean, these guys <laughs> are really led the way in this really understanding the biology and the individuality of a tumor, what are the different features that all tumors share, needing blood supply, for example, shutting off the immune system, very common. And then what are those things you describe them as targeted therapies that are very specific to a patient? And so we talk about precision medicine as targeting, targeting a drug for that patient, for that disease. And my biggest fear is that every patient will have a unique disease and we need a unique drug for every single patient. So how can we do that a whole lot faster? but there are also these core things that all tumors share. So linking those two things together has been very effective. And really, it's the underlying biology that makes that possible. Now, Bob, you um, were there at the very beginning with RAS. This, this is a good story, I think, uh, a cautionary tale in some ways about cancer discovery uh, and, and drug development. Uh, it's found in 30 35% of all cancers. And we've known this for 30 plus years. Uh, nobody's been able to make a drug against this oncogene, this driving mutation. People have known, like, if you could bind with that, uh, shut it down, I mean, that would obviously be hugely helpful and a big seller, too. And yet nobody's been able to do it. Well, it's worthwhile saying that, let's say, before 1975, we really didn't know the molecular mechanisms that went awry inside cancer cells. In that year and the next year, here at UCSF in the Varmus Bishop Laboratory, we began to get the first glimmers of the molecular mechanisms. And while at that, in that year we knew almost nothing, in the ensuing decades we accumulated an enormous amount of information on the molecular engines that are driving cancer cell growth. The faith was that if you understand the causative mechanisms of the disease, that will lead as day follows night to therapies. But the fact of the matter is understanding causation has not translated in the great majority of cases to truly useful therapies. There have been flashes in the pan. Um, for example, Gleevec has been dramatically successful in treating a chronic myelogenous leukemia. And with that success, one began to hope that a whole series of other uh, similar kinase inhibitors, as they're called, would prove equally successful. Uh, but the fact is that that's been a, uh, an idea which has proven illusory because most kinds of tumors have not proven responsive to similar kinds of drugs like Gleevec, and to the extent they have, it's only been for six, eight, 10 months with no overall gain necessarily in long-term longevity of the cancer patient. So it's been very frustrating. Uh, I thought that if, in 1982, you could begin to develop some general laws about how cancer cells arose. And the, more, the deeper we all, that is the community of cancer researchers, went into this, the more we realized that cancer is a much more wily and elusive uh, foe than any one of us would have suspected. There's probably 200, 220 different subtypes of cancer. Even within a given subtype, every patient's tumor is different. And most frustratingly, these tumors are very plastic. They can change like chameleons from one biological state to another and thereby elude uh, therapy. The new tools that we hear a lot about for gathering information about cancer, like next generation genome sequencing, and uh, biomarkers, and uh, sophisticated high resolution imaging, uh, flow cytometry, cell counters. I mean, we've got tremendous tools to look deeper and deeper into the cell. Generating and, data, but not necessarily generating insights into what's going on. Yeah. So there's a love for gathering enormous data sets, sequencing thousands of cancer cell genomes, with the presumption that somehow this will afford uh, insights into new ways of treating patients. But I've become a little bit uh, jaundiced uh, about, about that, I'm a little jaded. It has redefined our understanding of, of cancer. I mean, we don't talk about it in an organ-based way. We don't just say breast cancer. We say HER2-positive breast cancer, or HER2-negative, or triple-negative breast cancer. Um, and there's all kinds of, you mentioned 220 different subtypes 
of cancer. I mean, we could have this conversation a couple years from now, and there might be 300. I mean, we keep slicing it, and as Michelle said, um, everybody's unique in a certain way. Michelle, are, are, are you a little more optimistic about these tools? Are we, are we just kind of struggling to figure out what to do with all this data, and, and we'll get there? Yes, we're struggling to figure out what to do with all this data, which doesn't mean the data won't ultimately be useful. But we need to be able to make drugs faster as well. So the more um, widely the disease is, the more we're playing whack-a-mole. So that as soon as one subpopulation of the cancer goes down, another subpopulation arises and then gives rise to resistance, which is why you can often have a gap in, um, so you can increase the amount of time before somebody progresses on disease and yet not improve their overall survival because the disease comes back really aggressively. So we have a lot of complexity there, uh, which doesn't mean that all that data won't eventually help us. I think part of it is that, so RAS is a good example. Mm -hmm. We understood that it was important biology. The nuances of it we're still trying to understand. But also targeting RAS itself, it was considered an undruggable target. We knew it was there, we knew it was important, but we didn't know how to get a molecule to stick to it in a way that would block its function. And so because of that, we go after things that are a little bit away from it, that we do know how to target, and they're a little bit distal from the thing that we're really interested in. And those work for a time, but since they're not the, the core, they're the periphery, then maybe that's a reason we can generate resistance. Whereas now we're starting to target subclasses of RAS and also the RAS protein-protein interactions that it makes. So RAS functions by being uh, turned on all the time instead of being on and off. And when it's turned on all the time, it, it signals uh, for the next baton to be passed and that eventually leads to cancer growth, to uncontrolled growth. So if you can block its ability to pass the baton, and you can figure out technically how to do that, that's been a big breakthrough in looking at the problem a little bit differently. Has there been a problem with a little too much uh, narrow reductionism in, in biology? Because you know, we know from so much of your work over the years, Bob, that there's, there's oncogenes, there's tumor suppressor genes, and they're often you know, achieving some kind of balance when we are normally going about without cancer. And then something happens where that balance gets thrown off, allowing this uncontrolled cellular growth, which is cancer, to occur. Uh, do, we, do we need to throw more at it? Like, two, three, four different combo agents in many cases to get where we want. That will surely be the long-term solution. Uh, NAPO is, is very specialized in that. But we have to remember that when you throw two agents at a cancer, there's also a lot of rate-limiting toxicities. You might end up killing the patient before you kill the tumor, which is always awkward <laughs> for a clinical <laughs> oncologist. Not the goal. <laughs> These large data sets you were talking about before, I'm not at all convinced they will uh, accrue to, to our benefit. People who were gathering them said, well, we'll just use artificial intelligence to interpret what's going on there. I must say, uh, I often say, if you, after you've talked with somebody who's a proponent of artificial intelligence, if you shake hands with that person, you should count your fingers afterwards <laughs> because... Uh, I, I don't necessarily totally believe all the claims of, of, of those people. Uh, I fear we're going to have large data sets that will be archived somewhere and, and, and will remain forever uninterpretable in the sense of not yielding significant specific insights into how to treat pa uh, patients, tumors. I still, I still uh, uh, say a few words about, you know, yeah, it's on. Just, just, just hold it close. Combination. Yeah. Even the uh, uh, R2 kind of uh, access, you know. There is there is totally unexpected counterintuitive benefit to combine the two agents that target the same pathway, like a trastuzumab and pertuzumab, okay, uh, interacting you know, with different epitopin. These are two different antibodies two from different Genentech antibodies. that uh, go after the HER2 um, protein that's overexpressed yeah. in breast cancer. So it's like a double blockade of yeah. the same signaling pathway it's for totally tumor growth. It's counterintuitive because most of the time, if you block it, uh, the same pathway with another agent, then nothing happens. You, you, as uh, Bob will say, you're all increasing the toxicity. In this case, there has been a very significant increase improvement in, in survival. In, uh, so it, it is very difficult to predict at times. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's easy to throw stones. Uh, 
In other words, it's easy to be curmudgeonly, as I'm being, <laughs> to be a negativist. Because if we, if we were against everything and we were skeptical, we'd still be in the Stone Age. But one has to admit the fact that it's been very frustrating in terms of converting basic insights into the etiology, into the causation of disease, into truly useful therapies. And by the way, if I can throw another hand grenade. Please do. If you look at uh, successes in reducing cancer mortality, uh, some of them will come from new drugs, which, as you know, cost often three quarters to $1 billion to develop. Uh, we're gonna run out of money out for developing all these new drugs. Um, and to the extent that, that we get all excited about improvements in cancer therapy, to the extent that they succeed, major advances are often reducing cancer mortality by a factor of half a percent, or let's say a proportion of half a percent. Uh, and soon, with the aging of the population, and the increase in the age-related disease of cancer and actually Alzheimer's, uh, we're just gonna run out of money to treat all these cancers aggressively because the number of cancer patients is gonna increase progressively because of the aging of the population. But the productivity of the economy is not gonna increase concomitantly. And so I'm increasingly of the mind that the major advances in reducing mortality can come only and will come only from reducing incidence which is not very popular among my colleagues who have devoted their, their uh, careers to developing new kinds of therapy. Anti-smoking campaigns, for instance. That's, I mean, it's the messy business of human psychology and yeah. behavioral modification, and none of us wants to become involved in that, even though uh, the, the benefits potentially are orders of magnitude more than anything we in the basic cancer research community could uh, think of achieving. I actually agree that I think the pricing and access issue around new cancer therapies is gonna be a really tough nut to crack. Uh, some of these new cell therapies that Michelle alluded to cost $375,000, $475,000, uh, and they work uh, very well uh, for a small group of people. But if you were able to generalize that across larger numbers of cancer patients, scalability, uh, the, the math is just impossible. Um, who's gonna pay for that? Yeah. And how are people going to be able to get it? Um, it's, it's a real problem. So, um, but Michelle, there was something, he, he made a, a remark about artificial <laughs> intelligence and large data sets uh, in a very skeptical way. You, you're not of that same mind, why? Uh, well, I mean, what he's talking about is the bioinformatics is figuring out what, what to target about a cancer based on data. What we're working on, I'm part of a consortium called Atom that's working with several national laboratories, uh, big data and um, drug discovery experts, National Cancer Institute, to use artificial intelligence to more rapidly develop drugs. So it's more at the, okay, once you've identified a target, that's the big problem that we've been talking about really is uh -huh. what to target. But maybe you don't have to be as smart about it if you can target it faster and get to a proof of concept faster. So get a molecule that you can test faster and more efficiently. One of the big problems, so using artificial intelligence to really speed up our design, make test cycle. So drug discovery is a bit of, a, it's a cross between science and engineering. So we have to design a drug based on what we know about how the structure leads to its function, the structure of the molecule leads to the function of the molecule, make it work better. And usually what we do is we first make the molecule bind really tightly to the thing we want it to bind to, and then we try to make it survive in the liver so it doesn't get seen as food or poison and get gotten rid of. So it gets to the tumor, and then we try to make it safe so that it kills the tumor before it kills the patient. And if we could do those things in parallel instead of doing them linearly, we could speed up the process a lot. And we've seen this in the history of drug discovery, moving some of those later stage issues earlier in the discovery process, and, and it's really changed why drugs fail. But the key issue for, you know, cost is a key issue. Key issue is failure. So one in 10 drug projects that we start in the pharmaceutical industry make it to the clinic, and then one out of 10 that we start in the clinic that we put in a patient 
makes it to a successful drug. Huge amount of waste Huge in the system. The, the, cost, the, the head of Merck Research Labs, Roger Perlmutter, famously said, whenever a drug gets approved, it's a bloody miracle. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Despite all this data and pre you know, predictive power, we think we have. That's right, because it isn't really an engineering problem because we don't understand biology well enough, right? We can't map out what it needs to look like, like we can some other complicated thing, like my colleague Adam likes to talk about um, building an airplane. What's the difference between building an airplane and building a drug? We understand the physics of airplanes, and we don't understand the, the physics, the biology of drugs. So if we can, anything we can do to do that faster, to do that more efficiently, that's one of the things about antibody drug discovery that's been so impressive, is that you understand the biology you're targeting, the molecules easier to make. You can get to a, a fail or succeed uh, process point faster. But an antibody only binds with targets on the surface of cells, and that's a pretty small number of targets, really, compared to what's inside the cell. And that's where small molecules, like your traditional aspirin, they can get inside yeah. cells. Every modality has its, its time and place. Right? Mm -hmm. And so um, I used to work at a company in the early days of small molecule discovery for the, for protein-protein interactions, like VEGF binding to its receptor. And there we said, well, if we can make a molecule that does what an antibody does, it would blow the antibody out of the water. It's so much easier to make. It's so much cheaper. Mm -hmm. But actually, antibodies are very good drugs. They have some very good properties that small molecules. So what's the right modality for that target? What's the right way of looking at the problem? And if we can do that faster, then we can fail less or we can fail faster. Uh -huh. and move uh -huh. on. But there is a problem which I think you are alluding to, the predictability. The fact you know, that you know, the animal model is so poorly predictive. Uh, this is a very, very serious problem. We don't fully understand you know, why this happened. If, if you've got to get cancer, it's good to be a mouse. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> We've Absolutely. cured cancer in mice this many, many times. Added. Well, it's really interesting, too, because why did it take us so long to come around to immunotherapy? because we treated our drugs in immunocompromised mice so we could stick a human tumor in the mouse. So that's one thing that really holds us back, those assumptions we don't even realize we're making um, that, that make it easier to kill a xenografted tumor in a mouse than it does a human tumor in a human. And 10 years ago, nobody really believed, except with a very few exceptions, in immunotherapy. That was, that was just not mainstream biology 10 years ago. It was smoke and mirrors, and it's not that now. Yeah, yeah it's front and center. Yeah. Well, when I was a postdoc, the first uh, postdoc at Genentech was the year Herceptin got approved, which mm -hmm. dates me quite precisely. And, uh, <laughs> and then nobody thought antibodies. You know, for a long time, we were swimming upstream with antibody therapies, and now they're mainstays for a lot of diseases. So you just have to be the one who's pushing forward and following the data mm -hmm. instead of the... Are the tools, what, what excites you about the tools on your, your workbench these days, Michelle? I mean, th is there something about the way we can make small molecules so that they can bind in certain ways with certain kinds of protein-protein interaction targets? I mean, the analogy sometimes people use is sort of like these two kind of like, uh, you know, vertical rock faces that don't really have much of a toehold on them, right? right? But now we're figuring out ways to make molecules that can sort of scaffold or lattice their way in there. Right, so some of it is, um, it's, some of it is figuring out what's the right target, what's the right technology to use to find molecules that bind that target, because you get what you screen for, is the adage. So you have to use the right set of molecules in the first place, and this is maybe a place where virtual screening or where artificial intelligence can help, or different types of experiments, different types of libraries. So it's really matching the technology to the problem, the binding problem in the case you're describing. And then also understanding the, that most proteins are not really these two cliff faces coming together, but they move. Mm -hmm. And when they move, sometimes they have pockets that you can stick a molecule into. So how do you find those? How do you set up your system to find those rare events? Um, and then the next thing is, when is a small molecule just not the right way to go? But there's some other modality, some emerging modality, um, nucleic acids or something more next gen that's going to be the better way to attack that particular problem. CRISPR, we hear about <laughs> uh, RNA interference. There are lots of different ways to interact with targets now that um, we didn't have uh, 10, 15 years ago. I, I think the current model, what we're doing, 
I liken it to uh, a, a big ocean liner about to hit a large iceberg, given the economic realities of, of therapy, uh, drug development, therapy, uh, therapy development. And the question is, is what my uh, colleagues are doing here, is it going to rescue us before we hit the iceberg? Because the, the era of uh, developing three quarters of a billion dollar drugs, which is what they cost now, it's almost over. Nobody can, will be able to afford it anymore. What are, the, what are these people smoking who think that we can? <laughs> well, so where, where do you think we're going to end up here 10 years from now, Bob? Are, are we going to have a flat line here on cancer death rates and five-year survival rates? Are we going to get nowhere? I, I honestly don't know. I don't mean to be so negative. Again, if we were all negative like I'm being, we would still be in the Stone Age. But the forward trajectory over the next decade, it's not totally obvious to me given these increasingly acute economic realities. So one thing that you see when you look at um, pediatric ALL, for example. Acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Pediatric leukemia, yes. Mm -hmm. um, it's a rare disease, and it used to be nobody survived, and now most kids survive. And they're old drugs. They're, from a standpoint of biology, boring old drugs. but decades of exactly how to use it, exactly how do you dose it, how do you combine things. So you see incremental improvements in cancer over time. Um, and then you try to layer these breakthrough drugs on top of that incremental improvement in how to use drugs. So we have this um, incorrect idea that as soon as a drug is approved, it's done, it's on the bookshelf. It's not. It's a living thing that you're always trying to improve the patient population, the timing, the dosing, the combinations. Actually, we learn a lot about mechanisms years after a drug has been on the market. Oh, it actually works in another way in addition to the one originally theorized. Right. Um, yeah. <laughs> you throws forth new hypotheses. Yeah, you can be a little too smart if your drug is too specific. Napoleon, uh, do you think uh, we're going to bend the curve on survival uh, in the next five to ten years? I don't know if this is kind of the, the prediction which are very dangerous. There are some <laughs> famous people, famously <laughs> difficult to. <laughs> but I think I, I'm not so pessimistic. I think that there has been some. Uh, if you look, for example, survival in colon cancer from the days with the, with the five of you alone, with the multiple age, there has been very significant, meaningful improvement. And I suspect we'll continue to see that. Maybe we won't see this uh, quote unquote a cure for cancer, but it'll be meaningful you know, improvement in. in, in in survival, in progression, for survival, etc. Maybe AI will help us with the combinatorial yeah. problem of like, what's how, how do you take two or three agents together at what dose yeah. and what schedule? I mean, there's a lot of possibilities there. Yeah. Just um, just count your fingers afterwards. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I'll remember that. And uh, I think with that, I think we're we're out of time. Thank you, everybody, for listening. <laughs>
Um, but we're here with three people who've spent a lot of time thinking about higher dimensions. So let me introduce them to you, and then we'll see what they can teach us about higher dimensions. So um, to my right is Emmy Murphy. She's an assistant professor of mathematics at Northwestern University and a winner of this year's New Horizons in Mathematics Prize. Her work is primarily in symplectic topology, a field that connects geometry to many different areas of physics. And then um, in the center, we've got Terence Tao, a professor of mathematics at UCLA. He's a winner of the Fields Medal, one of the highest honors in mathematics. And in 2015, he received the Breakthrough Prize in Mathematics for his contributions to harmonic analysis, combinatorics, partial differential equations, and analytic number theory. And then at the far end is Alex Eskin, who's the Arthur Holly Compton Distinguished Service Professor in the Department of Mathematics at the University of Chicago. He won this year's Breakthrough Prize in Mathematics for studying deep connections between the dynamics of things like billiard tables and the geometry of certain high dimensional spaces. So defining higher dimensional spaces is not the hard part. Um, you might remember from high school math that in the flat plane, we can make an x-axis and a y-axis, and then every point in the plane has two coordinates, like two numbers that specify where that point sits along those two axes. And similarly, in three-dimensional space, we can make three axes, and then every point in space has three coordinates. So if we want to talk about four-dimensional space, we can just define it to be all of the, to be a collection of points where every point is just a list of four numbers, four coordinates. And if we want to create a 17-dimensional space, then we can say that every point in that space is just a different list of 17 numbers. And even this just very basic definition of higher dimensional spaces is, is already enough to make these spaces incredibly relevant to all sorts of areas of math, physics, computer science, data analysis, and so on. So the first thing that I wanted to ask you is simply, what are some examples of some of the ways that we can use these higher dimensional spaces to model phenomena in the real world? Um, well, um, I think the most relevant these days is in, is in data science. Um, so as you said, you know, our notion of space started from geometry, uh, from the physical world. Um, but the great thing about mathematics is that you can take intuition that's, that's sourced from something that, from direct experience, you formalize it, and then it becomes something that, um, that becomes abstract, and then you can take it into, into other um, domains where your original intuition no longer um, applies, but you can still um, 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 carry over some of the ideas and concepts. Uh, so as you say, um, yeah, so starting from the time of Descartes, we realized that, that points in space can be realized uh, can be uh, represented by strings of numbers. And when you formalize that, you realize you can do the reverse. Anything which can be rep represented by a string of numbers, it, it can be a, viewed as a point in a space. So a, an image, for example, um, a, a modern image it, oh, on a computer, like a megapixel image, just a million points, each of which has an intensity. Uh, let's say black and white for simplicity. It's just a million numbers. And you can think of that, uh, each image as a single point in a million dimensional space. Um, and then if you have uh, collections of images, like for example, a whole collection of cats, um, each cat is a single point, uh, each image of a cat is a single point in the space, and so you have this cloud of points, and then if you have a whole collection of dogs, you have another cloud of points. Um, and you might be interested in, in, in writing some AI that can distinguish, you know, given an image, which one is a cat, which one is a dog. And now you, have, uh, you can think of it geometrically as, as a question of given two clouds of points in a really big space, how do you separate them? Um, and then you can think about the problem by starting back in low dimensions and thinking about the same problem in low dimensions, like a plane or um, space where you can, you can, you can use your, your, your visual intuition and then try to extend it back to high dimensions. Um, and sometimes that works, uh, sometimes it doesn't. High dimensions have some things in common with low dimensions and some things are very different. Um, in fact, often what we do, actually, we take the high dimensional problem and we try to project it back down to low dimensions where things work. Um, yeah, so, so certainly data science is, is, is a very, uh, um, modern application of these high dimensional ge geometry techniques. Yeah, I mean, one example is this famous Netflix challenge where they challenge people to produce the best Netflix prediction algorithm. And that's also somehow a problem which would be kind of you can formalize by 
each Netflix show is a response to one dimension. And then for each sub Netflix subscriber, you have a whole, for each show, you have some sort of a preference. And so it's a whole bunch of points in this very high dimensional space, which is as large as the number of shows. And somehow the idea that maybe we can interpolate like a much lower dimensional object through these very high dimensional shape and use that to make predictions about what other shows people would watch. And so that's something which is easy to do. And if, I mean, if you have points in the plane, you can probably figure out what is the best line which fits, you know, what's the line which best fits with the points, but it's not so easy to do if there are very, very large number of dimensions. And just maybe to round things off with an example from physics, just a very simple example. So if we were trying to understand the motion of the planets in space, um, so every planet has three coordinates. Um, I'm old fashioned, so I'm gonna say there's nine planets. And so that means that, um, so, so we have three coordinates for each planet. That's a list of 27 numbers. So if we wanted, instead of trying to keep track of nine things moving around in three dimensional space, we could keep track of one thing moving around in 27 dimensional space. So, um, so these are all examples where just the, these coordinate systems can help us to model something. But so it's, it's one thing to be manipulating lists of numbers. And it's another thing to be sort of truly like visualizing these higher dimensional spaces. So I wanted to ask you all, like, to what extent do you feel that you're able to visualize these spaces? And do you feel that it's important? Do you feel that mathematicians have to be able to visualize them to some extent to be able to make discoveries about them? Well, I mean, um, if you can visualize them, that's great. Um, and so, so uh, I mean, so sometimes, like, so um, uh, I work primarily in high dimensions, and sometimes low dimensional intuition works. Um, um, but sometimes you can draw intuition from other sources. Um, so one thing you realize when you, when you abstract a definition, um, like, like, like that of space, is that many other things that you didn't think of as spaces become um, um, are also spaces. Um, so for, for example, uh, one thing in low dimensions, 